welcome back to the Salvatore Show and today I am honoured to be joined by the Member of Parliament for Barking since 1994, Dame Margaret Hodge. So um, in the past you have described yourself as a secular Jew, um, what does your Jewish background mean to you and what did it mean to your family as well? Um, my Jewish background has always been integral to my identity but uh, it's tied up much more with the fact that I'm an immigrant. I came here at the age of five and my uh, parents had escaped two countries uh, for fear of persecution. So my dad came from Germany. He left actually in the early thirties uh, when uh, there was an economic crisis in Germany and he couldn't get a job and he had an uncle in Egypt who offered him a job. My mum, more dramatically, came from Austria. And family law has it that she wandered down the aisle with this boyfriend. He turned out to be a Nazi. So they he abandoned her and she met my dad in Egypt and they married. And then, of course, uh, they lived, my father lived in Egypt for about 20 years. And then with the creation of uh, the State of Israel, uh, life began to get uncomfortable for Jews uh, in Egypt. And he had a throne stone a stone thrown through the window of his uh, office in Alexandria. And um, I think, you know, he must have been just, you know, we just come through the Holocaust. This was 1948. Yeah. Uh, and it must have been incredibly raw in their minds. So they came to the UK. So I've always seen myself an immigrant in my very early memories. I remember the plane. I was four. I remember the plane journey. I remember the bed and breakfast. I remember the horrid vegetables over boiled cabbage and 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 porridge in the morning and I was used to sort of succulent mangoes and yeah. lots of fresh fruit and spicy spicy meals not not uh tasteless cabbage um I remember very early uh uh, uh, uh you know a, a very early incidents of uh, uh of discrimination um our friends were all German Jewish refugees, German and Austrian Jewish refugees. So I, our social life was with entirely with people of, of uh of my, you know, who my parents felt comfortable with and had relationships with and who had also escaped. But they were both atheists. So we didn't we didn't actually uh, my and my that was a sort of it was a strong view held by my parents. So we didn't become members of a synagogue. And I think the other thing is they were assimilists. So my father had assimilated, their family had assimilated in, in Germany. And uh, my mother, anybody who's seen, seen Leopoldstadt, my mother's family was very a Leopoldstadt-type style family. So I think they wanted to assimilate in the UK. So we were culturally very Jewish, culturally very Jewish. But we had we didn't have Jewish religion. I think there was drive towards assimilation, and I very much felt an outsider. Um, uh, uh, so it was always it, it was always with me. And then you know, at a very early age, I mean, just looking back on it now, when you sort of think about things in different perspectives, my maiden name was Oppenheimer, so it's pretty Jewish, yeah. obviously Jewish yeah. name. Uh, sadly, not related to South African Oppenheimers, as private I like to believe. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, we've now found with the new Robert Oppenheimer that yes. there's not a blood relationship, but there's a relationship through marriage oh. uh, with, with him. But it's a very common name, it comes from a village in South Germany, and a lot of the Jews who came from Eastern Europe went through there and adopted the name. Um uh, so uh, it, it was a very obvious uh, Jewish name. And I think my earliest really awful memories of it were uh, when I was a, a councillor in London. I was leader in Islington Council. Uh, it was during the time that Mrs Thatcher was prime minister and there was a battle royal going on between the government, local government and the unions. And we were yeah. in the local government bit of that. People like Ken Livingstone were around, John MacDonald, Ted, a guy called Ted Knight, now dead, but he was a very uh, important actor at, the, at that time. And I remember going to these endless meetings and we'd all get together. I was leading for Labour in London. I was led Islington Council, but I also led an organisation that brought together all the Labour councillors in London, going to down to the GLC. And um, Ken Owens got a very sneery little voice. 
And he used to say, here comes the Oppenheimer and start talking about the wealth. And I'd go home and I'd say to my husband, I'm sure he's been anti-Semitic, but actually um, he can't be. He's an anti-racist. And I bought into that at yeah. that time. So my Jewish identity is always important. I've never hidden it, but it's never, I've never, you know, I've missed out probably not being a member of a community of, of a community through a synagogue. Thank you. That was really fascinating to hear. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to, you know, your kind of parliamentary career now, you are the chair of the all party parliamentary group on British Jews. Um what does your role entail and can you tell the listeners what work the group does? The reason I've ended up being chair of this very important group is that outrageously, appallingly and very, very sadly, there are now very, very few Jewish Labour MPs in, in, in Britain. And if you go into Google and just look for the list of Jewish MPs, you'll find that, you know, up until the 70s, there were lots of Jews in Parliament. Jews are activists. They want they want to get stuck into um, uh, changing the world and making the world a better place. Um, and uh, the vast majority, I mean, at one point, over 90% of Jews who were MPs were Labour MPs. Oh, wow. Um, and it is a sort of tragedy about with culminating in Corbynism, that that has now that I am now the last woman Jewish Labour MP in Parliament at this point, where I'm hoping to be joined by some new colleagues. I won't be there, but that I'm hoping that I know that new new Jewish women will be joining the Parliamentary Labour Party, and I was the last active. The, Jew, the there are there are three or three Jewish men who are Labour MPs, but none of them took an active role in fighting the anti-Semitism of the Labour Party. So the reason I have digressed a little bit like that, and I mean, if I read, read through to you the list, if you, you'll think of the sort of famous, you know, uh, 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 Jewish MPs that were around. Um, Manny Shinwell, a lot of people will remember from the past. Um, uh, he was, he was a, he was a, a, a very effective Jewish MP. George Strauss was in a very important um, ja, uh, ba, uh, Janet Barnett Janet. He was important. Um, I'm just looking at the ones that people would have heard of. Sidney Silverman, mm -hmm. Daniel Frankel, Louis Silkin. Um, you know, there were some really big figures. Morris Edelman. There was Harold Lever. On, uh, in in the era of, of, of Harold Wilson. I went Morris Orbach, somebody I knew, Ian Mercado. Um, there, you know, there were some good, 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 good people. I, Julian Amory, actually. But anyway, there were good, some, some good people. So I'm left chairing most of the organisations to represent the Jewish community in Parliament because there's so few of us on our side. Yeah. One of the important things about showing... That you, the, the, the Labour Party has gone back to its basic values is um, uh, to encourage more Jews come and, and to join us on, on, on our side of the house. But as um, the chair of the All Party Group, we, we do a lot. We try and, for example, we had a, we've had a big role on the online safety bill, not as successful as I would like, to try and make the ghastly anti-Semitic abuse that I've certainly been a victim of to try and tackle uh, that role. We host the Mitzvah Day every year, and that's yeah. been a, a real joy. We've been working with the Foreign Office to uh, to ensure that the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard yes. group yeah. is, is uh, prescribed. Um, we've worked with organizations beyond the Jewish community to ensure religious freedoms for everybody in politics, which is, I think, important. Uh, we've hosted events on the issue about religious slaughter legislation uh, with Schechter UK. Um, and so it's a wide, wide range of topics and issues that um, meet our campaign. Brilliant. And thank you for your work with that. Um, so according to the Community Security Trust, last year, uh, 1,652 anti-Jewish hate incidents were recorded nationwide. Uh, this is the fifth 
highest annual total that's ever been uh, reported to the CST. Um, in recent years, what has been the cause of such a high amount of hate incidents? Well, Jeremy Corbyn, are we going to talk about that? that I'm going to later, probably. Yes, yes. Yeah. You want, want to come back to that. I mean, certainly uh, <clears throat> in the impact of Jeremy Corbyn on the rise of anti-Semitism was horrific. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's that. Um, and I think beyond that, um, people's identity, this sort of identity politics, it's one of the sort of worrying features of the trends that are emerging in politics. Yeah. So people's identity has suddenly become, uh, suddenly matters much more in the political domain. So, I mean, just to say to you, when I came in, because I'm not religious, because my Jewish identity didn't define me, I always used to say it's my, my immigrant identity that really was far more powerful in defining my politics. But because of all that, um, uh, I didn't do a lot in relation to Jewish yeah. affairs. It just wasn't there. And somehow the world has forced it onto me. And I think... Uh, uh, that that has had had, had an in impact. Um, I think also uh, the continuing uh, crisis in the Middle East, you know, which is yes. now reaching disproportionately appalling uh, levels. I think that has helped sort of you know divide divide communities, uh, and particularly you've got a growth of British Muslims here. Uh, with loyalties to uh, Palestine and um, uh, their communities. And that brings conflict with the uh, Jewish communities and their loyalty as Zionists to the Israeli community. Yeah. So that's been another feature that has uh, brought it. But I always say a, a, a number of things about this. So just be careful. Britain on the whole is still a... Take away the Corbyn blip. Thank God it's yeah. become a blip. Britain is still a to much, much more tolerant society. No, oh, absolutely. Other yeah. societies where I think it's much more difficult to be a Jew. You know, you think of Hungary, you think even of France. Yes. Uh, and um, whilst we should always, always be conscious of and aware and intervene early to slap down anti-Semitism, we shouldn't. I think there's there's a there's there's a uh, an, an unnecessarily over fear now about the impact of anti-Semitism in the UK. Thank you very much. Um, what more do you think the government or local authorities, I know you mentioned that you wanted more on the online safety bill, but uh, what more do you think the government or local authorities can do to combat the rise in anti-Jewish uh, anti hate incidents? Well, there's got to be a zero tolerance a perspective. Yeah. So uh, you, one can never ever, and that is utterly central to anything. So that uh, you stamp early and you stamp hard, uh, and uh, I think that, that that is very very important. And I think there's still a you you use the term anti-Semitism. It's a very weird term. Lots of people don't get it. I try when I talk in audiences to talk about Jew mm. hate and yeah. that that is a is a much uh easier sort of a concept for people to get their heads around they don't quite understand about anti-semitism it is shocking i mean which is why you're working at the holocaust education trust how quickly people are beginning to forget yes. uh the holocaust and where anti-semitism can take you to its worst conclusion uh, so history plays an important part. I think zero tolerance. I think education and training and learning about it is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, and uh, I also think um, building links between faiths is yeah. a very, very important way of building tolerance. Our faith mm. has a huge amount in common, ironically, with the Muslim faith, if you think about it. There are a lot of lot of similarities, both coming out of the Middle East, probably, and the cultures of the Middle East. And we should build uh, strength on that. I'll tell you a story which gave me some hope. 
uh, which I cling to a lot, is uh, in the middle of the my uh, vial, and really the horrible period when I was fighting anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, the Labour Party threatened at one point to expel me. And um, I had to fight hard to uh, <clears throat> keep my place in a party I joined at the age of 16, 17, 18. <laughs> and um, I went, to, I did represent an area, Barking, which used to be a white working class area, but which has very quickly transformed into a typical multiracial part of uh, the whole of London. And they've got a big Muslim community. And that a Muslim community is very active in Labour politics. So they're, they're disproportionately uh, represented in the Labour Party. And I was in the middle of this row, uh, uh, lawyers ringing me up every day, having to take decisions on was I going to concede anything. And um, uh, uh, I had a meeting. It all happened during the summer, all happened to July and August. And on the first Thursday of the month, I had to go down to my party meeting in, in, in Barking. And I realized that I hadn't actually been to talk to my Barking Party members about this issue at all. And I've never talked about my Jewish identity to them because it's never been relevant mm. to my politics. And I thought, sugar, I haven't fixed this meeting. There's a big Muslim uh, presence. It's going to be really hostile. I'm going to have a horrid time. Uh, and I drove down there, arrived in the room. There were 300 people in the room. Oh, wow. Many, many Muslims. And I thought, oh, my God, what a mistake, Margaret. You should have done the work. Uh, and the only way of handling it was to really tell the truth. So I did. And there are two things. First of all, with this very uh, strong Muslim presence in, in the hall, I got a standing ovation. And uh, then more interestingly, and all I did was talk about anti-Semitism, my own background and all that sort of stuff. And then most interestingly, about three members got up from the hall and said what you've described as anti-Semitism, Margaret, is entirely what we uh, experience as Islamophobia. And I think it's really important that we build on those links of joint of shared experiences to uh, create shared understandings that break down uh, racism. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's very true. And what an incredible story as well. Can you talk us through the recent anti-Semitism scandal in the Labour Party and how this affected you and what you did to confront this? Well, it was horrible. It was one of the most worst experience, worst parts mm -hmm. of it. I've had a very long political career. I've been in politics for coming on. It's my 50th year, um, 20 years in local government and 30 years as an MP. <clears throat> and I think it was it has been the most difficult uh, and and dra draining and horrible uh, period of my life. So, uh, as I said to you, I never really, my Jewish identity had never really been part of my political life. Yeah. Uh, and when Corbyn was first elected, I'd known him since 1983, because oh, wow. he had been MP in, in Islington, where I'd been the leader. And a number of people said to me, He's an anti semite and I said, no, I don't think he is. I think he's an anti-racist. Uh, and my experience of being all because of him was he was more interested in what was happening in Nicaragua than he was in what was happening in Islington. He never caused me much trouble. He and I never agreed politically. He was on the hard left. I was uh, centre left, and um, I was a Blairite. You know, he was a not. You know, he was a rev he was a not in militant, but he was in the hard left on, on the extreme. So we didn't talk a lot, but we were perfectly civil. We used to talk about Arsenal and things like that, and that was all fine. Um, and then I started getting anti-Semitic abuse. And I thought, what on earth is happening here? And I actually talked to Luciana Berger, who yeah. at that chair, time chaired the, uh, uh, the parliamentary arm of the Jewish labor movement. And she said, yeah, we're all getting it. Come along and join in. And we were just, it was beginning to grow. And I remember our first meeting there and we thought, what on earth can we do to stop it? And it was really difficult. There was, there'd be already been a number of incidents by then, which had been deeply worrying. Um, and the, the, the uh, party's leadership under Corbyn were totally inappropriate 
uh, responses, either ignoring or belittling or yeah. praising, in some cases, some of the anti-Semitic um, stuff. Uh, and this was all before the great demo, uh, enough, enough, is enough dev demo, but it just grew and grew and grew. Um, and um, I just found myself getting involved on that. So it was, I, I tell the jokey story, but it is true that my dad tried to make me a better Jew. And sadly, the rebellious daughter, he failed, that the rabbi locally tried to get me involved in, in Jewish, Jewish life. And he failed. I went to the London School of Economics, which in the, my days was known as the London Shul of Economics, because there were so many Jews uh, uh, studying there. And I had I had a very long relationship with an Israeli Jewish boyfriend. So, you know, I mixed with lots of Jews. They all tried to make me a better Jew, and they failed. And it took one Jeremy Corbyn to finally achieve in <laughs> making me a, a, a good Jew. So uh, that's how it all started. Um, it was horrific. Um, I mean, I haven't brought them with me today, but um, I I have had thousands and thousands and thousands of really disgusting, totally disgusting, abusive emails. In one period, I always say there was one period when the EHRC uh, submitted its report on anti-Semitism the Labour Party, and we mucked around with, you know, was Jeremy Corbyn in the party? Wasn't he in the party? Was good. You know, yeah. there was a period when, and he got up and said that the, that the reporter had exaggerated the problem uh, as a two month period. And um, I, I received 90,000 uh, mentions on social media in just wow. two months, monitored by CST. CST are a fantastic yeah. organization. They, they do all my media monitoring and referring to the police where appropriate. But it is a wow, isn't it, that in two months um, uh, uh, that's happened. And I have to say recently, because we've, there's a bill before the parliament at the moment that is uh, banning, trying to ban the BDS from, yeah, uh, okay. uh, and I, I oppose that bill for all sorts of good reasons, um, I hope, which I'm happy to share with you, but I don't think it's a good bill. I'm not that I support the organization, I don't support any boycotts of Israel, but I don't think this is the way to handle it. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is because I spoke out of, against the bill, every time I said anything about Jewish issues or Israeli issues, I get an absolute spike in in, in social media um, attacks. This time, when I said this is a bad bill, because I think it is, um, as a Zionist, um, I didn't get any, which demonstrates to me, or I got very few, and that demonstrates to me that the abuse I'm getting is mainly from the left, not from the yes. right all the anti-Semitism there. And then, do you want to hear about the incident with Corbyn? I think that was a... Do you want to hear that? Yeah, 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 please do, if that's okay uh, with you. Uh, that was, uh, you know, we were in the midst of it. We were very frustrating. He just wouldn't respond. You'd put complaints in. You'd get these horrible abuses and shove them in and say this from Labour Party members and say, well, they take disciplinary action and it go down a big black hole. Never, Nothing would ever have happened yeah. to it. And we'd been having the uh, debate as to whether to adopt the uh, internationally accepted definition of anti-Semitism, the ARA definition. And we were sitting in the House of Commons one night and uh, the NEC voters voting endlessly on Europe. It was a Brexit, it was a Brexit evening vote. And yeah. the NEC had chosen that day to discuss the ARA definition. And as we were there, I said to a friend of mine, oh God, what happened? And of course, Corbyn had rejected the definition and put down his own amendments. So I was absolutely livid because it was another big nail in the coffin of trying to uh, tackle the anti-Semitism party and build relationships with the Jewish community. Um, so I was furious and I was behind the speaker's chair in the House of Commons with two young lads who are my friends. And I said, I'm going to tell him he's an effing anti-Semitic racist. Mm -hmm. And um, they both of them said, "Go on, Margaret, have a go at it." Uh, and I thought, I said, "No, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to wait till he comes out of the chamber. He was sitting on the front bench, and I'm going to um, approach him privately as he comes out." And they said, "Go for it, Margaret." Then I looked round; they both disappeared. He comes out. Last thing I say to myself is, "Don't swear," but I do approach him and I do call him a 
racist and an anti-Semite. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it only lasts about two minutes because he's sort of uh, passive aggressive. He cannot engage in that sort of a debate yeah. um, in any way. And I think he's stubborn and a bit stupid and a very arrogant. You know, he's got all the wrong features of somebody who could be uh, a, a, a good politician. And um, I must have been up a little bit shaky because a friend of mine said, do you want a glass of water? So I had a glass of water and then I went off to the theatre, switched off my phone and thought, oh, well, at least I've done it. Um, I had my say. Didn't think twice about it. Came out after the theatre, having seen a really good play at the Young Vic, switched on my phone and the world had gone absolutely bananas ballistic because one of the young men who had been beside me had clearly decided to ring the press and tell them what I was going to do. Oh, that's so fun. That, that's a funny story. And um, well done for doing it as well. Um, but kind of leading on from the previous question, you know, as a Jewish person, how scary was the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister, you know, after his handling of anti-Semitism? Jeremy, the thought of Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister was petrifying for the Jewish community, petrifying for the British people. Because, you know, because of his worldview, his view yeah. about anti-NATO, pro-Russian, anti-America, you can take all his politics. It was petrifying for the nation. Uh, but for those of us, you know, who are Jews, uh, as an anti-Semite, um, now, you know, people took different decisions. Some decided to leave the party um, uh, 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 because they couldn't stand it anymore. I... And we all rested and everybody, you know, rested with, with what the hell should we do? Uh, and for me, um, I'm a fighter. If you look at my, if you look at my political career, I've been involved in a lot of battles. I fought the BNP in Barking in uh, 2015. I fought the Thatcher government in, in 2010. I fought the BNP in 2010. I was one of the leading uh, people who fought the uh, Thatcher government over uh, rate capping when she was controlling. I'm a fighter. That's my, that's in my nature, and I joined the Labour Party in eighteen at eighteen because it seemed to me as an immigrant Jew that the party it was the party that most it was the obvious party. It was the natural home for me, you know, because it was pro immigration. It was um, uh, and I had a hostile reception when we came. We didn't have a we weren't welcomed with open arms. It was uh, your. It was an in international, global in its perspective, and it want promoted equality. And those are the values that have always driven my actions and my mm -hmm. uh, beliefs. So I wasn't going to give up on the Labour Party no. and allow the vile values, which I thought offended the basic integrity of the party, to take precedent. I was going to fight it. If he'd won in 2015, something I couldn't say before, in 2019, if he'd won in 2019, and I'd been an MP, it would always have been for those, and I absolutely decided that I would then, at that point, do everything I could to stop him becoming Prime Minister. You know, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't wouldn't have sort of buckled down and... Um, no, no. Uh, and done it. And in a way, you can say what you say, but I think, I think what, you know, my strategy just happened to be the one that worked by yes. sitting... We, uh, we, and you can't beat from the outside. You've got to beat that sort of virus, hideous virus from within. You cannot, you can shout at it from the outside, but if you want to change it, you've got to get into it. And, uh, you know, and I think the thing that has surprised me is how quickly, you know, how strongly Keir has responded. I mean, he's been absolutely yeah. consistent in tackling anti Semitism. And if you look at the way, compare this to the 1980s when we had militant in the Labour Party, this has been a much more rapid uh, expulsion of bad people and transformation yeah. of the party back to its core values that are, you know, tolerant, anti-racist, really anti-racist, and certainly pro-Jewish. Uh, um, uh, uh, pro, pro, pro and. I know it's going to take a long, long time to convince people like you that we've, we've made this journey. But uh, for me, I've been, I have been, you know, really surprised at how quickly 
we've managed the reversal. And lots of what lots of that goes down to the Jewish labor movement, who they were at the core of of putting the uh, evidence to the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission. And also they have been involved in the training, very tough re training program now that uh, we make everybody do. Yeah, and yeah. I think all the other political parties have got, they've all got their problems around, not just mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, but other uh, uh, other forms of racism. I think yeah. they could learn a lot from what we have now established. No, absolutely. Um... And you and you just mentioned the um, Jewish labor movement. Oh, could you talk about you know the process and your involvement with the submissions to the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Yeah, I mean the Jewish labor movement was nothing really before. I mean it was a, it was the Jewish labor movement is the oldest affiliated organisation to the Labour Party, so it's been around for over a hundred years. So we're proud of that. You know, it was. Yeah. It was uh, 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 there, but it was not a very important JLLM uh, organized. A, you know, it was an important sort of arm of the Labour Party during anti-Semitism. Our membership mushroomed. We obviously invite both uh, Jews and non-Jews to be member. We're now one of the biggest. This <laughs> <I mean. laughs> of, of the sort of so-called socialist society affiliated, and that was for for people wanting to really demonstrate their support for the Jewish community. Yeah. In their hearts, in their, um, I think the submission to the uh, EHSE was was done by uh, two people really led led on it. Um, so it was the hard work of um, Adam Langelbun and Peter Mason who, you know, brought a lot a lot that together the work from whistleblowers, evidence from the various people who have been subject to anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So I think JLM played a key role in amassing. The evidence, which was then, which obviously then Mishkon Dura um, uh, uh, prepared in an appropriate way, mm -hmm. um, but without them, we wouldn't have had the outcome. I mean, they did a brilliant, brilliant job. That's fantastic, and um, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining me today, and thank you for all your work that you've done in your parliamentary career. It's been amazing and you're such an inspiration if I, if I might say so um thank you very much and thank you for spending your time speaking to me today okay and thank you to you for the work you're doing in the holocaust education trust as ambassador that really is important to keep the flame going in the future so keep thank going you. you very much and the organization which i think is brilliant